Welcome to the Swell Suite, everybody. Have you on Wednesday. So this is a very special episode. We have a super special guest. She's an author. Her name is Kiera Sonderker, and she is the author of Mixology and Murder. So this book is a book of cocktails and crimes. Kiera came up with the idea of introducing cocktails and pairing them with true crimes. Here is the description via Amazon. Pour yourself a drink and discover your latest true crime obsession with this guidebook that pairs 75 deliciously chilling cocktails with the infamous true crime stories that inspired them. She's going to tell us the full story of how this idea came about. And then also Tanisha jumps in and we talk a little bit about what's going on with her in Paris. Cheers. Welcome to the Swirl Suite. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. <laughs> so so I find the concept, concept of your book absolutely fascinating. But before we get into that, please introduce yourself to everyone. Okay. Um, so I'm Kiara Sondrecker. I am 24. I work in publishing in Brooklyn, New York, and um, I just published my first book, which is Mixology and Murder, and it is a true crime themed cocktail book. So uh, what's your role at your publishing company? Mm -hmm. So I'm an editorial. Actually, I I did just get promoted literally today. So Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I forget. Okay. So I am now an associate editor at Ulysses Press. Um, So we're um, an independent publishing house um, and we're based in Brooklyn and also in um, Berkeley, California. So I am on the editorial team. So I work with authors um, to, you know, help them develop their book ideas. I work in acquisitions to acquire books for our um, publishing house and just like kind of all the little nuanced editorial stuff. There's like a ton of random things that go into publishing a book. So I just like, you know, work on all those with the authors. So it's very fun. I really enjoy it. Got you. Well, I see a ton of books behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I my house is full of books. Yeah. So, <laughs> do you guys specialize in like specific types of books? Yeah, we are um, a nonfiction publisher, so gotcha. we really focus on um, like cocktail books, cookbooks, and then also just like pop culture in general. Mm. Um, and then we do lots of self help books. Uh, we do a lot in like the mind body spirit space. Um, Yeah. So kind of like trivia books, big thing. We do true crime. So yeah, a little bit of everything. (laughs) Uh So please tell me, tell me the complete story of how this idea came to you and what is it? Okay. Yeah. So uh, I guess I'll do a brief, what is it to start? So mixology and murder is kind of just like a fun, it was kind of a little passion project. I love love cocktails and I love true crime and so it's kind of marries those two ideas um and it's just like a fun like true crime themed cocktail book so each cocktail in the book um is paired with like a true crime story to kind of go along with it um and the idea for it really it came from work so I was when I was still an editorial assistant I was coming up for ideas for our um, blog on our website And I was just, we do true crime books. So I was like trying to think of maybe we could do like something true crime themed using some info from some of our books. Um, So I was just wanting to create like an interactive, fun blog post. And so my brain went to like, why don't we make like a true crime quiz? And then like based on like how you do in the quiz or like the answers you pick, you'll get paired with like a fun, like fall themed cocktail. Because this was last fall um, that I was thinking about this. And I honestly don't know, I have no idea where that idea came from. I was just like, this sounds, this sounds fun. So I took that to the team. I was just like, hey, I think I'm going to write this. And they were like, that, they were like, you know, that could be like, maybe that could be a cocktail book. They were like, that could be like more than just a blog post. And I was like, okay. I had like totally would never have thought of that on my own. But um, so that's kind of where it came from. And I, so they asked me if I wanted to do a little bit of research into seeing if like a cocktail book like this could work and so I did you know looked into that and there really hadn't been a a true crime themed cocktail book that was from a traditional publisher so I was like I think I think this could work and the team agreed and so we just kind of ran with it and they asked if I wanted to write it 
Um, and if not, uh, we could, you know, find an author who would be interested in doing it. But I was like, when am I ever going to get to do something like this again? So I just was like, I was like, sure, I'll, I'll write it. And um, yeah, so that's kind of how the book idea came to be. <laughs> so. Okay. So you have the idea, mm -hmm. cocktails and, and, and crime. How, what, what happens next? How did you guys like compile all the crimes that you would mention in the book? And then how did you select the cocktails and how long did it take? Yeah, <laughs> I, so I think time is so hard for me to like, remember, like the concept of time is so like warped now for me. So I'm trying to remember, I, I think I started it, started writing it in I want to say like the very beginning of February of last year. Um, so, and then I think it took me a, like about a couple months to, to get like, so I think maybe around like April or May to get the um, like actually like kind of all of the content down. And like, then obviously it needed like edited and fixed and things like that, but just to get like the basic pairings and the stories together. Um, and so I, how I kind of started was like, I didn't want to reinvent cocktails because like, I'm not like a professional mixologist. Like I'm not a bartender. So I didn't want to like try to create new cocktails. Cause I think I would have done like horribly if I had tried to do that. So I just really wanted to like, kind of do the, like the idea of just like classic true crime stories and classic cocktails. So I try to find connections with some like true crime stories with cocktails just on the like surface level something that I could like kind of that would bring them together so like for example when I was thinking about the blog post originally one of the ones that I was associating with like a famous true crime story was like John Wayne Gacy is a fam famous serial killer most people if they're into true crime like know who he is um, and he's from Chicago and so there's also um, there's a cocktail called the Chicago cocktail and so I was like that could be an interesting way like to pair those two together. And then also I was like, we could put a little twist on it and add some like strawberry into it because like John Wayne Gacy has um, like one of his last meal requests was a pound of fresh strawberries. It's like a very bizarre fact. So I was like, that could be cool to add that in, you know, a little to like make this cocktail work with this. So it was very like just me trying to think of ways that like fun little like subtle ways that these could be paired with and not not go like too too deep into it because like I didn't want to take away from the cocktails and also take away from the true crime stories I wanted it to just be kind of like a fun a fun way to experience both um so yeah and then like like I was thinking about like Ted Bundy and I was like one of his things that like people remember about him is um like his Volkswagen Beetle car and so I was like we could pair that with like a sidecar like it just like you know, fun little, fun little play, plays on words, things like that. So that's kind of, that's how I started. I tried to do, try to do some of the obvious, like true crime stories and kind of famous cocktails. Um, and as I went along, it did, it got harder to like come up with some um, pairings uh, just because I was like running out of ideas. I had this like huge list of cocktails and I would like search through them. Um, and like, you know, I try to keep it balanced of like, you know, I didn't want to do too many cocktails that, you know, featured rum as the main liquor or featured vodka as the main liquor because I didn't want it to be like, you know, too similar. So some of them I had to like, you know, be like, okay, got to stay away from those. Let's look at these cocktails and see what I can do. Things like that. So yeah, I think it took a couple months, but we, we got there. <laughs> so like, how does one research like true crime? So of course you have your books there uh, yeah. with your publishing company, but what else did you have to research through to find like the crimes that would match your book? Mm -hmm. I, so I knew a lot of your like well-known true crime stories just because I, I am like a fan of true crime. I listen to, you know, a lot of true crime podcasts. I've seen lots of documentaries and docu-series. So I, kind of wanted to keep keep some of the true crime like more recognizable so like the stuff that you know people kind of want to read about um or hear about so I I did like compile a list of like stuff I already knew so things I was like okay I have a basis of knowledge for this I can like use that do more digging and you know that'll be like relatively relatively easy 
Um, but then I did also include some more obscure stories. So for research, I really just like if there was a if there was a documentary on the topic, I watched that um, or watched it again if I had already seen it. Um, and then I really went in like to like news articles. That was probably the biggest thing I used just because sometimes you can find like the archives of like the actual articles of when it was happening. So that was very helpful instead of just like reading, you know, an article from like 2020 about something that happened in the seventies. So um, I did use a lot of that. I think that would, that was probably my main source of information. Um, just trying to find, you know, news articles about it. Um, so yeah, I think that, yeah, that was my main source of information. And um, it was really hard to try to pare down the story and really get it to just like the the main details, because you know, you can't go too long, um, can't write a whole book about every single story, even though you could. Um, so that, yeah, that was that was a little difficult, but. Is your book for sale now? Can everybody find it every Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it came out in October, October 19th. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, it's pretty much available wherever books are available. You can get it on Amazon, you can get it at Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, your local indie bookstore. So yeah, mm -hmm. wherever you find books. <laughs> you know what would be really cute? You know the ID channel? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it would be cute if you had like a commercial during all of, I mean, it's nothing but crimes, true crime stories yeah. on the channel anyway, but if you had like a commercial or like a little spot in between each one, just to talk about the crime and the cocktails, that would be so cute. Yeah, that would be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Yes. You have to find a way to pitch that. I hope people enjoy it. It was very fun to write. So, mm -hmm. um, I hope I had some friends who bought it who were like, we're going to use it to throw a like true crime themed like cocktail yes. night. And I was like, perfect. Great. That's exactly like why I made it. Yeah. So yeah, I just hope people like, can, you know, read it, have fun with it. So yeah, that, that sounds really fun. Yeah. Okay. So the next part of our segment are just like random questions. And okay. of course the theme is true crime. Okay. Mm -hmm. Love it. So the first question is what is your favorite true crime TV show? Ooh, oh, okay. I seen so many. Um, okay, I think one of I think my all time favorite is probably "I'll Be Gone in the Dark," which is based off of the book "I'll Be Gone in the Dark" by Michelle Mac McNamara, and I think it's on HBO. Um, and so that is all about the Golden State Killer, and she was the one who like basically single handedly decided that she was going to like look into this like decades old cold case um and try to find answers and so the book is all about you know her doing this and then they made it into um a tv show i think last year or maybe it was a year or two ago um but it's just like one of the most compelling true crime stories i've ever like i've ever read or watched because it's just you know it's someone who's actually like doing this on their own and trying to get like a cold case solved um and there's just like so many sides of it they talk to so many people you hear you know so many like different versions and just like the scope of the work like one person had to do and then like it's just so fascinating that like Michelle McNamara was able to like like she basically coined the term golden state killer which is how everyone pretty much refers to this serial killer and um, you know, it was her work that got people to like reopen the case and like start investigating again. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's just very, it's just like such a fascinating, like one of a kind story. So I would say that one's probably my favorite. And then second would be the jinx, which is, I think also on that or not on Netflix on HBO. And, um, that one's about Robert Durst, who is like this man from New York city and, his like wife went missing in the eighties and no one's ever seen her since. And a lot of people think like he murdered her, but it was never proven. And then he like goes to Texas and is accused of killing this one man. And then he's accused of killing his friend in LA, but like he never, like nothing ever is definitive. And so he always like manages to not, he's not convicted or anything for these crimes. And so the documentary just like fo it's, uh, follows him. So the, the crew just like follows him, gets his side of the story. Um, and I think it's like six episodes, but it has like a huge kind of, not a twist, but like a reveal like thing in the very last episode that was like 
so insane. I like gasped when I was watching it. I could not believe it. Um, I don't want to spoil it in case you want to see it, but okay. um, it's so good. And actually stuff with him has been happening in the news recently. So if you do look it up, you will get, it will spoil it. But so that's very interesting because it's like, you know, this thing that's been going on for decades and it's kind of like finally resolving. So wow, it's very good. Yeah. I'm going to jump in right quick. I saw that and passed <laughs> out when I, I saw the ending. I was like, oh man, both of y'all I, saw it. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, you know how obsessed with this kind of stuff I am. <laughs> I looked, mouth dropped and then I yep. fell out. And then when I came to, I was like, wait a minute. And the thing that's so crazy is he's an older guy. He's not like mm-hmm. a young guy. He's like, what, yeah. 60, 60, 70s? So, yeah. I mean, he's lived his whole life. So, no matter what happens to him now, he has had a full life. So, if he gets yeah. caught up, I mean, it's not like, so what, but I mean, what he'll spend three years in prison. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. So Tanisha, <laughs> we are at the part where I asked, what is your favorite true crime TV show? <laughs> um, I think it might just have to be, I might have to take it back in the day to American justice. That was probably my favorite with Bill Curtis because I love his voice and <laughs> yeah, that, that was it. Mine is, I have two. Um, I like watching, um, I think it's TV one that has, um, focuses on like the black stories or whatever. I just find that fascinating, Mm -hmm. but there's one called fatal attraction. Um, and then, um, on the ID channel, I like deadly women. Um, I I like watching that because, um, I feel like men like kill for like a handful of reasons, but women kill for a wide variety of things. And I like watching the way they, their brains work. Um, so yeah. those are my two faves. That's true. Men are more of the moment kind yeah. of like just something that happens to them in that moment and they do it. But yeah. women have to get to a certain point. Mm-hmm. And then I feel like they plan it out a little better. They're they not do. They as do. impulsive. Right. They're going to um, drop poison unless, in your glass. Right. Every yeah. day. Unless, until it's, you die. Yeah. unless it's snapped. <laughs> and then the women are right. snapped. That's like yeah. years of whatever happened. Right. And they just literally snap. Yeah. Which yeah. is also another entertaining show but (laughs) (laughs) okay next question what is the smartest criminal you've ever come across show book or whatever Mm, that's a tough one I know there are like definitely like people who have had like super high IQs that Mm -hmm. have like done stuff um I'm trying to think you of like smart because they like got away with it for a while um smart as in like wow I didn't even think to do that to cover up a murder or how did he do that or how did she do this well I'll, I'll go first because I okay. um, you are, you're clearly prepared <laughs> well, well I only could think of one and to me the DC sniper was really smart oh yeah who yeah. would have thought to yeah. cut a hole in your trunk and lay there and shoot mm-hmm. people you sight unseen and then ride out and then yeah. and then like there's this um there's this documentary i don't know if y'all watch it's called i sniper so it covers the entire footage from beginning wow. to end and even lee malvo is is in the documentary so he's telling the story also and you know, part of the story was um, he got away with this for so long because people were looking for a white van because somebody said a white van and, you know, they just kept saying this lie over and over again. And then at one of the crime scenes, he was there and was like, oh my goodness, what happened? And so- <laughs> they always are. They have to say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what's going on? Somebody <laughs> died? Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's terrible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who did it? Mm. yeah yeah so I thought he was pretty smart okay I still don't have one but um, no okay we can move I have I have one that's like not I feel like a smart and dumb it's like okay because it didn't work out I don't think (laughs) um (laughs) but um like D.B. Cooper the guy who hijacked the plane and stole like the like I think it was like two hundred thousand dollars but it was like back in the I want to say 70s um yeah but he just like went on a plane obviously db cooper's like not his real name um but like that's the name he gave and he like 
his plan to like get the money he like hijacked a plane like said he had a bomb or whatever and um made them land and then he made everyone like get off of the plane except for the pilots and like the FBI were there and everything but they couldn't board because he was like I have a bomb I'll blow it up and like all this stuff and so he like was really good at like manipulating them to like give him the money and like they refueled the plane for him and he like got got the pilots to take off again and was like going who knows where and then he like parachuted off of the plane in the like middle of the plane <laughs> ride and with the money and but then he was like never found again like they've never found him and so that's people, pretty like, smart speculate. yeah people speculate if he like did get away or maybe he like died in his like parachute attempt and they just like and it was over this huge forest and so they like searched Mm. and searched but like they've never found him so I don't know if that's like smart or if that was like incredibly Mm. stupid yeah (laughs) Yeah. he got away I think he's somewhere um, on on a beach but I think yeah yeah but I think he lives it up with that money very low key Mm -hmm. you know with his actual real name because nobody knew he was real and yeah yeah, there was that yeah Hmm. Tanisha, you think of an answer yet? You watch a lot of true crime. You got to think of one I smart know, one. I know it's all and it's all running together. I'm gonna come up with it as soon as we um get off, and I'm gonna be like, okay. oh my gosh, why didn't I say this one particular person? Okay. The only one coming to my mind is um, I mean, very basic, but Ted Bundy, how he used to just play. I mean, just so simple, just like hi, um, I have crutches. I'm in a cast. Can you please mm-hmm. help me? And then they'd help him get in the car, and then he hit him over the head with the crutch throw them in the van and then ride out yeah 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 so yeah. very basic I mean he was like he didn't even have to try any kind of maneuver he was just like yeah can you help me and, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, so <laughs> and then that was it and that's why people were mad at me like oh you don't want to help this person I don't know if he's a Ted Bundy or not. So, yeah <laughs> I am skeptical of everyone okay okay um Name a true crime movie, documentary, or story that just scared you to death. Let me go through my book. <laughs> <laughs> Refresh my memory. I'm trying to think. It takes a lot. I don't know. It takes a lot for you to get scared of like yeah. Of, yeah. of things. I will say like kind of unsettling back on Ted Bundy a little bit, but the like that Ted Bundy tapes thing that came out on Netflix that was just like very creepy just because it was like him talking it was just like hours of like recorded footage of him talking about like whether it was like his like crimes or it was just like him talking about like how he like thinks and sees the world and like or just like random things it was just like really unsettling to hear that and it was just like it was just creepy Mm -hmm. so I will say that was that was a creepy one that and if we're talking since uh Netflix the other one was I am a killer where they talk oh, to them. Oh, yeah. yeah. There were yeah. a couple of stories in there where I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I am scared to death. I have to turn this off and mm-hmm. turn on all the lights in my apartment. I have to turn <laughs> yeah. on and I'm stay awake. I'm shoving stuff up underneath the door so it can't open. <laughs> I'm sleeping mm-hmm. with a weapon. Like there were, yeah. a couple, there were a couple of men in there that I was like, ooh, you, I'm glad I never ran into you or came up against cross you, nothing but yeah, that one. Yeah. For me, it's anything that's unsolved. Mm. Cannot handle it. Any of it. (laughs) No unsolved mysteries. If I think that something's not going to be solved on the first 48, I'm turning it off. I cannot (laughs) handle it. And unsolved mysteries is riveting to me. Okay. I love unsolved mysteries. (laughs) Can't handle it. Yep. Because I'm going to think that person. The one on Netflix. Would you say the unsolved mysteries on Netflix, the the more recent one? No, no, absolutely not. (laughs) Because they had one and they had an episode in France. When I tell you that, girl, that episode was good too. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Is that the one with the family? The with the yes, the House of Horrors. Yeah, Yeah. I went to the house. The house you did. You crazy? (laughs) Went to the house. (laughs) <laughs> in September, I told some friends we we're gonna be in that city. It's in Nantes. It's in Nantes, France. And we were in that area to do some wine touring. And I was like, Oh, hey, do you know about this story? And the girl was like, No, I've never heard of it. So I was like, watch this on Unsolved Mystery. She watched it, said, Oh my god, we gotta find the house. I was like, Oh girl, I have the address. 
<laughs> Y'all both <laughs> going. Both like, I'm house. prepared. Mm-mm. So we have pictures in front of the in front of the house. <laughs> he took pictures. Wow. Well, you house. know what? I'm glad you made it. Glad you made it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a few of us, so you know I didn't go alone. This and we yeah. broad daylight. It was like two in the afternoon. There, we weren't playing any games. But yeah, we're in front of the door. <laughs> yeah Mm -hmm. keep playing keep playing uh okay next question what is the silliest mistake you've seen a criminal make or just like the dumbest criminal story you've ever heard Um, it's a few of those i think it just gets dumb when people tell somebody if you if you commit a crime and be quiet and take that to the grave you gotta uh, and never tell anybody again Mm. like there was this um uh, this crime was really big back um maybe 90s, but it was the Brown's chicken murders that happened uh, a little outside of Chicago. And nobody knew who did it or what happened for a while. How did they finally get caught? Because one of the guys who did it told a girlfriend, told his mm. girlfriend at the time, of course they break up. And she was like, well, since we not <laughs> together, I got something I want to tell the police. And so she went and told the police everything she knew. And somebody had the good sense, the one good thing that came out of um, that whole thing, because they had messed up the whole investigation. They had saved a piece of chicken that was in the trash and they did DNA on that and found out it was this guy's. And that's how he got caught. Mm. That's how they finally caught the people who did that. I think like another one is just like the BTK. BTK, um, he was like, you know killed people for like 20 years and then like dropped off the face of the earth it was like a cold case never solved and then like in the early 2000s he just like resurfaced and like started talking like sending letters to the police again and then he literally asked the police in one of his letters he was like is it all right if I send like my next communication like via a floppy disk and they were like yes and he did and they found like this metadata in it that was like literally like had his name in it and like other little details and so they like found him <laughs> and arrested him it's like, like <laughs> sir you don't want to be free yeah, and that's him like, getting I'm- beside himself thinking like oh i'm above them i'm smarter than them let me come back and talk to them again ha ha i got you yeah listen just kill your 25 people and just <laughs> go on into the you know into the dark unknown just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I think it's really hard to commit a murder or a crime like in this age everything is being watched there are cameras all over the place you you know leave your fingerprints and your DNA all over the place um there is a girl she writes mystery novels and she's on TikTok and all she does on TikTok is tell people how to get away with murder. So she goes through each story. Girl, what is her act? I'm about yeah, to her right I need now. to know. Oh what? gosh, I forgot it. I really, I forgot it. But I uh, got it. I know when I when I well, find it from this call and come back. <laughs> when I find it, I'm gonna send it to y'all. But yeah, so she um and she goes to these like crime conferences with police, so she can like like have actual like have everything current she wants everything current so she studies crime in real time and she gets on tiktok and she's like let me tell y'all what y'all shouldn't do if you commit a crime don't do this don't do that (laughs) do this oh wow and she is it's hilarious it is hilarious (laughs) no i think the thing it's not even necessarily now a matter of being smart because usually if you are committing crimes you're doing it on impulse and you're not doing it like trying to plan it out and think it through. You're doing it on yeah. impulse. But the thing now is, like you said, Sarita, so many people are watching. There's so yeah. many cameras out, people with phones taking pictures, video, yeah. um, CCTV, you know, all of that stuff. Somebody is going to see something. Yeah. yeah. Traffic yeah. camera, yeah. like you will get caught up because someone somewhere sees something. You do something yeah. dumb, like you park your car in a no park zone, you mm-hmm. get a ticket like exactly yeah yep yep so i have a uh i have a i have two stories actually i was watching fatal attraction last week and so this young guy got killed and this young guy he actually had some uh memory issues due to a previous accident so he couldn't drive because of his short-term memory anyway this guy goes to this dangerous neighborhood i forgot what state it was in and he gets killed and like he's missing for like weeks Nobody can find him. His family is scared to death. 
And so they find out that he's been talking to this girl online. So they contact, they finally find the girl and the girl was just like, oh, I'm so sorry. Is he missing? Oh my goodness. I can't believe this. So, <laughs> and so she was like, and I have an idea. I think who did it? I girl. So she was like, well, I think it was my baby daddy. So of course the baby, uh, baby's father's like, oh, I ain't never seen that dude. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. They get his phone y'all and find the app that he used to No, he pretended to be the girl to lure oh him god. to the neighborhood and forgot to no. delete the app. Oh my god. I was like, how stupid can you be? He didn't oh. delete the app. He did not delete Come the app. On. Idiot. Come so on. One. Yeah. Yep. Or like didn't even use a different phone. He like used no. his own phone. Like, right. yeah. he didn't use a burner phone. Like yeah. everybody yeah. use a burner phone. They yeah. were using burner pagers back in the day. Like why? It used to be using your regular phone. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, but stupid. Geez. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one they could recover an app if they wanted to, but the fact that he didn't even go that far, he was like, "I'm not even gonna delete it." It's fine. Yeah. I mean, and you should have seen him. They have actual footage of the interview um, during the investigation. Who was like, I. Oh my goodness, I do not know this guy. I've never seen him in my life. I it's mean, like, well, on. let the record show. <laughs> <laughs> and then the story was, oh, it was self-defense. This dude was like 6'5, 250, and this younger guy had to be a good 150 wet. He was so small. <laughs> I was like, it was no way. Yes, sir. <laughs> no way in the world. But uh, yeah, that was really stupid. Oh, and my second one is really dumb. Again with the food. This girl, she burglarized the house and I guess she was watching the family from outside of the house and she had a soda and Cheetos. There was Cheeto dust in the house <laughs> leading them outside. <laughs> <laughs> they found her blocks away and they said they, I mean, they put it together because she had Cheeto, um, Cheeto dust in her gums, like in her teeth. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious that story is on the new york post and it happened this year oh my god <laughs> see people not thinking stuff through yeah mm. yeah how you hungry and you about to burn mm. all right yeah right <laughs> i mean i guess it would have been worse if she had went inside and ate something like okay let me burglarize this house yeah. and then i'm gonna eat some stuff out there for the yeah crazy because i'm pretty sure that's happened before yeah like oh yeah like oh lip prints because they're like oh wait they got the good wine I'm gonna yeah. <laughs> oh, this, all right this burgundy? Oh, delicious. <laughs> last question tell us about a true crime that took place in your hometown i think about this question all the time and i like lived grew up in the middle of like rural ohio and i truly like have never had anything like that happen to me or like someone I know but I do have one from like my college town that I lived in for four years when I went to college um which definitely happened before I was like around it was like but it's like famous for like story in our college um so basically there was a student there in the 50s in the 1950s and he just like disappeared like disappeared off the face of the earth and like no one has seen him since. His name was Ronald Taman, And I'm pretty sure he was a sophomore and he lived in a dorm that's like now demolished. It's not there anymore. But he was like, I think it was like in, it was in April and he, his roommate came home and all the lights in their dorm were on. His like psychology book was out on his desk. Like he had been studying it and he just like wasn't there. And his roommate like didn't think anything of it and then like but the next day he didn't come back and so he like reported it and like this huge search for him like happened and no one just like no one saw them no one had any leads nothing and he just like disappeared and I think like years later people came forward and were like oh I saw him the day after and he looked like super confused and like you know, out of it and someone, and then the coroner of the county, but it's Butler County in, I think the seventies, so like 20 years later was like, said that Taman had like visited his office and like wanted a blood test like a couple months before his disappearance, but like for no reason. And so there's like a whole range of like, cons like theories about what happened to him. And like, some of them are like 
deep. Like people think he like got involved with like MK Ultra, like which is that would be crazy. But there's like a whole like I'm pretty sure someone someone did a podcast or like a series like a uh, essay series about it, and they like went really deep into it. Some people think he was just like murdered, and um, people say they like see his ghost there now. Um, and even when the building, his dorm was demolished, I think that happened also in the 70s, uh, they like searched for a body like after that and like never found anything. But yeah, he just has never, ever been, never been seen again. So oh, wow. I think that's the yeah. most saddest thing or craziest thing when people go missing. Yeah. Yeah. Like what happened? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. when you have like no answers, like, I mean, Jean Bonnet, what? Yeah. Where is she? Mm hmm. And then the other girl, Madeline, where, where are these people? Oh, Madeline McCann, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Girl, where are you? What happened? Mm. Yeah. So, well, I mean, and unfortunately those are both kids, but even when adults go missing, it's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just crazy that like, a, like no trace of someone can be like yeah. found. Right. Yeah. And even after all this time, it's like, okay, nothing. Like we have all this technology now mm-hmm. and all this facial recognition and all this stuff. Tanisha, exactly. so what's your answer? My answer, what was, I'm sorry. What was the oh, question? so <laughs> tell us about a true crime story <laughs> in your hometown. Girl, I'm from Chicago. All of I- this true crime. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, are you kidding me? <laughs> tell one, tell, tell the one. Valentine's Day Massacre. Um, mm-hmm. So I say, I mean, I told you the end of it, but um, the Brown's Chicken one, that was one that I actually like lived through and paid attention to it. Mm-hmm. These um, guys went in um, when Brown's Chicken was about to close one night and um, they killed everybody and took the money. So the people mm-hmm. who was in there eating and then all the people who worked there. And for years, it went unsolved until that guy broke up with his girlfriend and she was like, uh-uh, I'm gonna tell it all. <laughs> but it was hard for them to solve it too because they messed up things. They were walking through the snow. Okay, this is, it wasn't Chicago. It was like just outside of Chicago. So one of the suburbs. Um, they walked through the snow, messed up any footprints that they could have found. Um, nobody had gloves on inside. Um, somebody was messing with the stove and turned on um, one of the pots of grease. So that bubbled up and boiled over. So now it's grease all over the Mm. um, stove and the floor. So if there were any fingerprints or footprints or whatever, now those were compromised. Um, So they, the good thing they did was save that piece of chicken to later Mm. get the DNA from. But other than that, no, they kind of really messed it up. And um, there were books written about it. Um, podcasting wasn't a thing at the time so it was you know people wrote books and Mm. articles um and I think it's been talked about on a podcast since then but yeah that was a a a big one yeah Um, other than all the other random Chicago crimes yeah uh DC same (laughs) same uh a lot of crime but there were a few that made national news of course DC sniper made national news but um there was one like uh in 2015 it was the murder mansion so it's a big, it's a multi-million dollar mansion in DC and this entire family gets killed. So you got a family of three, the parents and the son, I think the son was 10 and the housekeeper gets killed also. So it turns out um, they were held captive there by this guy and um, he broke into the house, held them cap, like tied them down um, to chairs or whatever. And I forgot how he killed them. It might've been like stabbing or shooting. I can't remember, but anyway, killed them all. Then he sets the house on fire. So <laughs> what sense that makes, I don't know. Maybe he was trying to destroy all the DNA. People in there. think it's going to destroy the evidence. Yeah. But, Which yeah. it did not do because. It never, it never does. <laughs> uh, of course, food was involved. They checked the trash can. He ate a half slice of pizza and it was in the trash. His DNA was all over it, linked him to the house. And was he it was random? Arrested. Like, did he know them? Um, it was a mansion, so we're just assuming it was a robbery because he stole the car. It was a Ferrari, and I mean, he like, drove. Did he know the people? Did he work I, at the house? I'm did not sure. There? If I'm not mistaken, I heard that he might have delivered something there. Okay. So I don't think he knew the people. Um, okay. But um, yeah, he had stole the car. I guess he drove that around for a while and then set that on fire <clears throat> in some random lot. But yeah, that's how he got caught eating pizza in the house i guess he got hungry overnight 
Just like that girl with the Cheeto dust. It was either she <laughs> was outside or she ate <laughs> chicken inside. Like she was getting caught because she's not smart. <laughs> yeah. And like, how do you expect to keep a Ferrari? Like that's definitely exactly. not under the radar. Right. Where are you exactly. parking it? Number one, yeah. you don't live nowhere nice to park it if you're robbing mm-hmm. people. Two, yeah. your friends are going to be like, where did this come from? And if anybody asked them later, like oh um you know what's going on with ask them any questions they'll be like um I did yeah. see uh Jeff with a Ferrari when mm-hmm. he's back I was wondering what the deal is what yeah. the deal was or they'll talk if he's not talking his friends will talk mm-hmm. another reason yeah. people get caught up they talk they brag they show something to one person and that person tells somebody that person yeah. tells five people then five people tell now is public knowledge and you know what else is really boring when spouses kill each other for like um the life insurance like how old is that story like y'all still doing that you know how easy is it is to get caught doing that <laughs> i just yes. don't understand <laughs> and sometimes it don't even be for that much money like right right and the ones that is you know that is for like oh well he stands to get five million i'm like well she didn't <laughs> give a lot of extra lip but <laughs> 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 like they don't get away with it like have you never yeah. watched any true crime read any book like seen yeah. any news report they don't get away with it Crazy. unless you're oj Simpson. well <sighs> well well, <laughs> well Blake, did he get he got away with that so, mm, mm, okay. mm. so you most of the time don't get away no. yeah 99 <laughs> percent of the time you don't get away so Kiara, one more time, um, tell everybody where they can find your book. Um, yeah, so you can find Mixology and Murder um, pretty much anywhere where books are sold. So Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, your local indie bookstore. Um, yeah, it should be there. It is a perfect gift for um, your true crime lover for Christmas. Yeah. Something super cool for them. It certainly is. And I'm looking forward <laughs> to making a Helter Skelter Punch for free. <laughs> guess you're wondering because that story is also crazy but yes yes well thank you so much for joining us this was so fun yeah thank you for having me it was great i loved just talking about true crime it's my favorite thing (laughs) awesome so tanisha i've watched your instagram and i don't i what is going on you are doing so much (laughs) tell me it all (laughs) Okay, so I think what you're talking to is I was um, intonisé. So what you think that loosely translates to inducted into this organization called Es Chansonnerie de Pape. And it's a wine brotherhood of Chateau Neuf de Pape. So we all know Chateau Neuf de Pape um, from the Southern Rhone Valley, Major Grape Grenache. And um, yeah, it's just a group of wine professionals, people who are um, doing well in the industry and that they have to be recommended by someone already in the organization. I have the pleasure of knowing um, Madame Nicole Rollet. She is the owner of Chen Bleu, which is also in the Southern Rome. And uh, she recommended me and they accepted that recommendation, that nomination. And so I was inducted and that ceremony was uh, over the weekend. It was amazing. They gave me a key. Like I've been down, they put a key around my neck. Oh, and wow. And they gave me like a, um, a magnum with uh, it's engraved on the front and has the organization name on the front. And then I have a um, like a scroll. I haven't even unscrolled oh, it. I saw nice. somebody else do it. I, like I just have it. It's in a velvet tube. <laughs> fancy. Fancy schmancy. Oh my gosh. Does your title <laughs> change or anything? Girl, no. People have okay. been saying Dane, but I'm like, I also just got in the damn Descoffier. So like, that's the thing too. But like, whatever. But this, the thing that's uh, crazy about this is they have to ask you a question mm-hmm. on stage in front of everybody. Mm-hmm. So they, Madame Tanisha Townsend, and I love the way French people say Madame Tanisha Townsend, are we? And so I get up, go up there. And so my question was um, explain the terroir and uh, this wine, the Chateau Neuf de Pop wine to my audience. Talk like I'm talking to my audience. And they just hand me a glass of wine. I'm like, um, okay. So you have to guess going. what it is? I mean, since I'm there, I'm like, okay, so a Chateau Neuf de Pop, yes. Okay, right. I'm assuming it's that. So I just gave taste and notes for Chateau Neuf de Pop. I was like, oh, okay, you know, 
um, Grenache, grape Grenache, and uh, um, I'm getting raspberry, hints of dark plum, maybe a bit of pepper on the end, but very rich fruit, medium body. And so I said it in English, because I was like, well, if I'm talking to my audience, I would say it in English. And he was like, oh, okay. And so then he uh, he turned to the audience and said, okay, pour traduction, uh, elle aime le vin. So forget everything I said. He was like, the translation, she likes the wine. And then everybody laughed. Oh, cute. And that was it. <laughs> that was it. But it was cute because when he asked me my question, he did it in French and English. Okay. So he did it in parts. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm about to do this. First. I was like, teach you can do this in French. You can do this in French. And I was like, wait. He was like, what am I going to say to my readers and my audience? And I was like, je travaille en anglais, donc mon réponse serait en anglais. And he was like, uh, bien sûr. Fantastic. What this wine tastes like <laughs> and the soil is as follows. <laughs> because still, well, one, I got nervous once I got up there because I looked out. I mean, it's red carpet. These people in these velvet robes and caps, they had a little long trumpet. So all of this is going on and I'm looking out and I see the people. And it's, of course, the guy taking pictures and I'm like, French is not happening. So English it is. So I froze in French. Also, um, even though my French is fine and decent now, if I'm speaking with someone one-on-one, -on -one, when it comes to wine terms, I still explain wine and describe wine in English. Mm, I hear okay. it and understand it when other people say it to me in French. But when I'm giving classes, tours, whatever, that's still in English because that's still with Anglophones, whether they're mm -hmm. American, Canadian, British, whatever. So for me to flip the switch and do it in French, that, yeah, mm, not yet. Okay. We're working toward that. But yeah, that was the whole thing. So now I am recognized by the Echansonnier. It's hard to say. Echansonnier. Echansonnerie. Echansonnerie. See? I well, congratulations, because it looked awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I didn't know all that it was until I got there. Like, yeah, I looked oh, it up really? online. I was like, okay, okay. what you trying to put me in? Is this a cult? Like, what is this? Uh -huh. um, and then when I went, I was like, whoa, oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah, and speaking of which, I have some people I need to email tomorrow, some cards and stuff that I got uh, from the event, people that I talked to. So that I want to keep in contact with. A couple of them live in Paris. And one guy was like, yeah, um, I run the museum there. If you ever want to come to the museum? send me a message I'm like so see you tomorrow <laughs> and I'm like well I'll be reaching out thank you but um everybody was super nice they um also mentioned me again at a uh, dinner because there's a big dinner after where they're bringing out magnums of Chateauneuf de Porno wow. they they have amphora of Chateauneuf coming out and they're and they bring one it's a stand on each table and they sit the amphora on the table da, 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 da. Started off with white and then we went into red and then a mark. And I was like, well, this is a night to be old. Huh. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> but um, they mentioned how I was an um, étranger, so a stranger, a foreigner. Oh, um, okay. But still, but still very welcome um, in the organization. And they appreciate and respect what I am doing for French wine, Chateau of the Pop, and um, the culture. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> This is so nice. And also just to, it felt good to be recognized after all this work I put in over yeah. this period of time. And then also be accepted because it's hard being, um, it's hard being a foreigner anywhere. Yeah. But to be in wine, to be a woman, an American, Black, like all of those things. And then to be in this organization and have them on a stage talking about you are accepted, we appreciate what you're doing in the industry. We appreciate what you're doing for our culture and how you're sharing it. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to need a couple more tissues because <laughs> um, ooh, somebody is cutting onions at the table. This is crazy. That's what? awesome. So yeah, that, um, that happened on the weekend and then stayed out there. That was in Avignon. Also, it was at the um, Pope's Palace is where this whole thing happened so wow there's that so we're in there um the palais du pop uh, and 
and the, uh, the woman who recommended me, she has a winery that's uh, maybe like 40 minutes away. So we went out to the winery after and stayed there uh, for mm-hmm. the night. And they got up in the morning, it's snowing. So the picture how of the beautiful. snow, I was like, is this really how life is going for me right I now? I mean, it is sounds it, absolutely magical. Is this how we about to end 2021? Because I'm here for it. So it was snowing. So I'm screaming and I was like, well, changing my ticket, not leaving at nine o'clock. So <laughs> changed my train ticket. We walked around the property because I had a friend with me um, who came with me. And then there was another girl who um, Madame Brulé had invited. And so we were all hanging out. And then we walked, we had breakfast, a crackling fireplace, mm. having breakfast. And it's in a restored medieval castle. Wow. Then we walk around the property, walk amongst the vines that are covered in snow at this point. Mm. There's a pond out there. And then she's like, oh, well, make sure you walk to the back to see the sheep. I was like, I'm sorry, the what? We hear bells. We go back. It's like 50 sheep just running around. I mean, they're all, you know, contained in a fence, but we see the sheep. And then we walk further and we see a tennis court. And then she comes out and then she takes us around the winery um and we see where they make the wine we walk in the tasting room we get a bottle and then um our taxi comes to take us to the train station wow. it was delightful i was like i gotta go back to my apartment <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds that that sounds absolutely stunning yeah and i was thinking like man i need like one of my you know homies homies here i'm like man if sarita live here i'm like sarita come on we riding out oh man I would have loved you know, to it was a good friend who went with me so I'm glad she was able to um to go and experience that she's like I'm so proud of you and this is really good to see this so anytime you come to me and you you know you're feeling down or that your career isn't going where you want it to go or you don't know what you want to do I'm gonna remind you of this moment mm. I was like okay amen girl well, you do that <laughs> I was like okay <laughs> you do that so yeah that um that was that I love it yeah uh, nothing else really coming up uh just teaching this class Whew. and what Thanks. class are you teaching this is the um economics of wine class with mm. the uh, study abroad students nice mm-hmm. well isn't it yeah. wait it's what is holiday season yeah the girl we still got five more classes left next week and the week after okay our last class is like the 16th oh okay oh oh yeah well, i'm like how no, often- I, I'm, how often is the class? Uh, usually twice a week. Next week oh, is three okay. times. Oh, wow. Next week is Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And then the week after that is Tuesday, Thursday. Gotcha. Okay. I got some guest speakers coming in. I'm like, I can't because the class is three hours. <laughs> three hours. Yeah, girl, three hours. I'm like, I, I have three hours is a lot. I, I know you talk a lot, but I can see you getting tired after uh-huh. a certain time. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, and three, and it's not face to face. It's um, it's hybrid. So it's people in uh, four other countries, and then it's people sitting in the classroom with me too. Mm, okay. So it's people in the classroom, and then it's people on Zoom, and of course the people on Zoom, you know, some of them are like informal, you know, a classroom where they're looking at it. Then there are other ones that are in their bed. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, what are y'all doing? <laughs> like, come on, what? Like, and you're there for three hours. Do you expect to stay up? No, mm. it's impossible. That's hilarious. So, that is that. Oh man. Oh, before I stop recording, um, everybody go to the Swirl Suite Instagram and check out me and Leslie. We did a short live about Advent calendars. It was fun and cute. Um, because I'm eating and drinking through three right now. Um, I saw that like wh- yeah okay so let me I see no let me tell you what happened so I bought one from Costco and not that the wine is like superb in these boxes but it's fun to do during the holiday season it is. so I got one from Costco um and um one of my cousins she gifted me the Wall Street Journal version a very okay. advent calendar which is massive and their wine is good 
So I was yeah, like, oh, that's a nice we're, one. we're drinking this one for sure. Yeah, that's a so, nice one. I wrote about both of those. I wrote an article for the Spruce Eats on the best mm-hmm. advent calendars. Like yeah. in November, I wrote that. And both of those um, made yeah. the list. But yeah, the Wall Street Journal one is, is bomb. Um, the Costco one is good too. And you get more bang for your buck with the Costco one. Like you could, it's, you get half a bottle. So you can split that with someone and, you know, be good for like each day. But, um, oh, and the other one is chocolates. So we had a previous guest, Alex. Um, she introduced us to ch- two chicks with chocolate and they're a woman owned chocolate company in New Jersey and they have a chocolate advent calendar. So, um, love it. yeah, so it was fun. Get it, it was sis. fun. Get it, sis. Get it, yeah. Sis. I it love was people fun. doing one stuff. But we will see y'all next week for uh, After Dark with Ray. <laughs> Thanks for joining the Swell Suite, everybody. We hope you are having a wonderful holiday. We have one more episode before we go on a slight holiday break for two weeks, but we hope you enjoy our final episode of 2021, After Dark with Ray. So we'll have some fun. See you next week. Cheers.